future and we think about the traveler, one of the things that I think is really important for us to assess is risk management, climate change, and how the world is going to be changing. And I've been very fortunate in the design of this conference to have support from experts. And if you remember, Jake Barr led the talent panel yesterday. And Jeremiah Owang came and talked about social. And Mitch Free was able to free up a schedule to come and talk about additive manufacturing. I, I'm very pleased that Mickey North Rizza, who I worked with at AMR and does a lot of work in sourcing and risk management and does work with ISM around risk management, was offering to spend some time with us today to really lead this panel on risk management. So with that, Mickey, I'm going to bring you to the stage. Um, Mickey now works for Bravo Solutions, and she's an expert in sourcing and risk management, and th this panel is going to talk about the world and how it's evolving. So Thanks, Laura. Uh -huh. So good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining all of us. Um, the title is around the role of climate change and as it pertains to supply chain. And in our earlier discussions as a group, we were talking about the fact that we didn't want this to be a political debate around the role of climate change, whether it exists or not, because what we're all certain of is that the environment that we're operating in is definitely changing with storms and hurricanes and, and earthquakes and things seem to be bubbling up in different types of frequency. So we're going to take a look at that with our group today. First, what I'd like to do is introduce the panel. Uh, Nancy, we'll start with you. If you could tell us a little bit about your background and the role you're bringing today. Great. Uh, welcome. And my name is Nancy Gillis, as was stated. I am with Ernst & Young. I'm with our climate change and sustainability practice based in Washington, DC. Um, I am a system modeler and actually look at the impact of different types of risks on the system called the supply chain. In particular interest is what is under the rubric of climate change, inclusive of weather patterns, resource availability, um, and then also changing temperature. So I am actually new to Ernst & Young though. I just come from the government having played the role of being the director of the federal supply chain for the General Services Administration. So that was one of the reasons, uh, <clears throat> if you've noted, that there has been a, a little bit of a political divide on the, the conversation of climate change, but I so am grateful that we're not going to recreate that conversation <laughs> here. <laughs> Kyle? Uh, my name is Kyle Beatty, and um, I uh, am responsible for a group called an Atmospheric and Environmental Research. Um, I want to give a little context of kind of the, the environment we fit in. We're a part of a, about a $1.8 billion uh, global analytics organization called Verisk Analytics. Uh, that company focuses on um, uh, really harvesting information from industries like uh, healthcare, uh, personal finance, uh, uh, things that would relate to cargo theft and, and other uh, industry verticals like the insurance industry. Uh, we're kind of a data clearinghouse for those market segments. My division is focused on taking that information in conjunction with weather, climate, and environmental analytics and, and translating those into impacts that can drive either strategic or operational decisions. My personal background is I'm a weather guy by, by training. I've done a variety of different roles in, in the weather industry over the years. Um, and much of that has found its way in more of a financial application uh, throughout my career. Great, so let's start off with that. Right before we uh, jumped up here on the stage, we had a discussion around some of the roles that weather can play. And I was relating a story that I was sitting here, an alert came to me to tell me that there was a major storm in uh, my home area, letting me know that there were 500 lightning strikes within a like 10 minute time frame, and asking if anybody had any hail or anything. And so as we we're having this conversation, all of a sudden Kyle pulls up this app that is really cool, I might add. And so I guess my first question is, can you tell us a little bit about this app and how this works and, and other apps that might be weather related that we could all take a look at? Sure, so just to give some context, what I was, what I was showing is that um, when we've had extreme weather, and there's two, kind of two situations that may be highlighted. One is that if somebody saw the news in Boulder, Colorado, this, you know, mm -hmm. the, over the last day there's been extreme flooding there. Um, and similarly, we've, there's some storms on the East Coast that are producing hail and other kinds of uh, lightning events. What's, what's different from weather information today from where it was in the past was 
Um, it's truly available to, to provide uh, information that would be at a facility level of precision. So think of it rooftop level precision data from a weather perspective with about 10 to 12 second latency. So it can be very, very rapid in that, in that regard. Uh, part of where we, we play the role by leveraging some of the knowledge of industry impact uh, for, for the example of the, the hail, you know, we convert that into a, uh, a calculation of effectively how many roof squares are damaged, what does that mean for demand, and then manufacturers of those roof squares coordinate with their retail and wholesale distribution partners to place orders and then expedite the, um, the, the shipment of that product. Uh, and you know, that was designed around trying to avoid some of the biases that are inherent in the system if, if you know, the sales side of the organization is driving that demand forecast. So that's an example of how we're using weather analytics to have very low latency forecast of, of demand when weather is really the dominant factor. Um, so that's one, one illustration of how, how that works. So along those lines, as we start out here, one of the questions I have is around the impact of some of the environmental changes and climate changes that we've seen, what their impacts have been on the supply chain. I'm wondering if the two of you could relate some of the stories in that of, of some of your clients in that that you've worked with and some of the things that you've seen you've been able to help them with. Um, and then later, I'd like to look at where you see that going in the future. So for now, kind of what's been happening, current state. All right, so um, I think people have asked me, what is this true impact of climate change on a supply chain, and, and why should I care about it? And it seems so far away, uh, if there is. And so let's break down a little bit about what it means to, to actually have that as a quantifiable risk. I think there's three types of risks that are under the umbrella of climate change and even kind of sustainability. The first is what we talked about here, weather pattern shift. Changing in weather patterns, the fact that they are more volatile, that they're um, more extreme, and, and you've been seeing some of that. And I think Kyle will talk a little bit more about what that really does mean in practice. But you also have resource availability. And who here has not been to a supply chain conference where somebody has talked about water? I mean, right? That's, it was, oh yeah, water's important. <clears throat> do, you feel, do you feel that covered? We've acknowledged it, water's important. There's gonna be less of water. That, that's kind of where the level of a lot of the conversation is, that there's this, okay, we understand that water is important as a natural resource. I know I have to somehow address it, but, but what does that mean for my supply chain? So that's kind of the, the second tier of, of understanding, which is resource availability, and I'll drill down. And then the third is really temperature change, and what does that mean as far as, uh, especially in the agricultural sector, uh, availability of some core resources. So the first thing that, that I think, going back off the water example, is knowledge of where is your supply chain. Because water or any other natural resource is really only a risk to you or even an opportunity, depending on where you're located. So how many here would say that you know where your supply chain is geographically located? Raise hands. A few hands. Don't hold back. Not a lot. And then if I were to then ask, OK, are you in Thailand? Do you know where in Thailand? Bad example. Do you know where in Thailand? <laughs> so, it's, so it's getting to a level of understanding because again, water or flood risk or any of those are really just relevant to a very specific locale um, across the globe. And just as well as the knowledge of where those suppliers are at, at, it is the knowledge of the route that your supply chain is taking. So one of the things that people don't talk about is the opportunity for climate change. The example I wanna, I wanna give is we know about the plight of the polar bear and the uh, ice going away in, in the northern part of our planet, right? Can we have a moment for the, the polar bears? Thank you. So the flip side of the polar bears not having a home, as bad as that is, is that you now have the opening of the Northeast Passage. Has anybody been tracking that? So about two weeks ago, China sent its first merchant ship going from China to EU through the Northeast Passage. Shaved 15 days off of the time it would have taken for them to go through the Suez Canal. They're expecting to send over the next seven years up to 15% of their ship traffic through there. 
right? And, and what does that mean for a supply chain now that you have a new route available? This is, this is both the, you have to be aware of the risks, which is the locale, where your suppliers are, and what does that mean to them as far as access to resources that they may need, such as water for manufacturing processes or even for the products yourselves, Coca-Cola, of course, and water. They're really paying attention to it. But also the benefits, the routes that you may now have available to yourself. So I'll stop there, but that's a little bit about what it now means to really think about climate change and your supply chain. So just to, to sh share my thoughts on that, I guess I'll, I'll frame a little bit about how climate change plays a role in the, the conversation we have with our clients. And um, I guess the first element I'll, I'll frame is that um, I'd say climate change is a context that's driving a utilization of weather um, or environmental data into a different type of an operational framework. Um, our focus in general is not what's the weather going to be in 20 or 30 or 40 years. I mean, we could, you can, could offer perspectives on that, but that tends to be less, less the orientation. It's more about what kind of changes have taken place today, um, you know, what, what are effectively in the bank, what can we plan for for the next three, four, five years, uh, and based on that, how does that need an operational uh, plan to adapt um, to uh, respond to that. So as an example, just to give you some, some weather context, um, what, we, what we see demonstrably, whether it's uh, in the, uh, the, the energy market, the agricultural market, uh, for things that would relate to uh, physical damage to properties, or just the day-to-day -day, uh, temperatures that we might experience that affect our lives, um, we see a very extreme uh, shift in terms of the amount of volatility of that. Um, so what I mean by that is if you try and calculate you know, the average number of hurricanes per year or other things like that that would take place, you may not see necessarily a change in those statistics, but what you will see is much greater volatility. Seasons start earlier or later than they used to. There's more in a given year and then less patterns that, that take place in the, in, uh, in the weather in terms of temperature, which would play into drought or agricultural impacts, tend to stick around a little bit longer. Um, and so we see that increased, that increased volatility of the weather for, for me, when I think about things like the, the risk to a supply chain, even if my averages are the same, if, my, if the range of variation is much more extreme, that means more risk. Um, and so um, we very much focus on that as being the context. Um, and that change in that range of, of volatility of weather has been what you can track fairly steadily over the last couple of decades. So. Uh, we don't really focus too much on what the cause is. Um, uh, again, there's scientific views on that, but effectively, we're, if we're seeing a steady trend over two, three decades of increasing volatility, the, the statistical chance that that's going to reverse in a very short time frame is ex exceedingly low. So um, really, our perspective is that uh, rather than focusing on the, the, the root cause of that, uh, focusing much more on that being the, the new operating environment we have to to manage in, whether it be for a demand planning use or a supply chain risk assessment. And that's really the, the framework we take when, when working with companies uh, around those issues. So a question on that. Um, if you look right now at the hurricanes on the east coast of the U.S., uh, we've already passed the halfway point for the six-month time frame of when the hurricanes traditionally hit. And for the first time in a long time, we haven't had a major storm. Um, before that halfway point. So as you look at some of the models and things that you're working with, and I know you're concentrating more on the volatility of it, what do you see over these next three months in regards to hurricanes? Um, well, you know, I guess one of the challenges is a bit that the, the low activity of this season is not something that we fully understand. We can observe that it's lower activity, but uh, being able to understand exactly what's causing it to be lower has is, is got a lot of people actually scratching their heads. Um, and so to be able to say that that would be sustaining for the next several months is, is tough to, to explicitly forecast. Um, but uh, there are certain aspects that have driven that to be low that we can track, such as dust coming off of the, um, the Sahara, which affects the ability for storms to get, get ramped up in the tropical Atlantic. Um, so you know, I'd say that it's tough to really translate that to an explicit forecast throughout the full season but it would have to be extremely, extremely active to just get back to norm because of how, how uh, low the activity has been uh, to date. So specific to North Atlantic hurricane activity, I'd say it's, it's probably unlikely we're going to get to something that would be an at or above average season. That said, 
a lot of the measures around whether or not a season is normal uh, don't necessarily pertain to the impacts they would have on an individual business. You know, they're, mm. they're often um, statistics around how many storms are wandering around in the Atlantic. It only really takes one to affect you know, an area like we saw with Sandy or, or Irene prior to that. It only takes one event to really drive a major, um, you know, a major business continuity problem or you know, a disruption in the supply chain. Um, so when we do look at individual storms, we tend to forecast what they're going to do um, at longer lead times to be ahead of consumer behavior um, and also to, to, again, bring down that precision to individual properties so we can say something like, um, you know, this property is expected to lose power at this time and it will be restor restored at this time uh, and do that facility by facility to trigger things like you know, either backup generator needs, dry ice for refrigerated goods, that kind of element. So uh, we, we tend to focus a bit more in that, that, that operational or tactical context for, for things like hurricanes. So on that uh, note there, as you start looking at the impact and the supply chains that uh, this type of an environment, the weather patterns. You're talking a little bit about the Dust Bowl and how that may make a change to the hurricanes and whatnot that are going on. Uh, how do you actually look at that and say what supply chains may be impacted? How does that all come together? How is that brought back into the supply chain world? So, um, so I'll, I'll frame it first from a risk perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that when we, we had the sessions on big data yesterday, it, it kind of got me thinking about the way we approach risk assessment to supply chains by using uh, different types of, of weather-related models. And I use the term weather because that's a, a bulk of the problems, but we focus on earthquakes and other kinds of, of, of uh, man-made disasters that could also cause pretty large disruption. But what we, what we do is we simulate effectively uh, thousands and thousands of, of probable um, but uh, not yet uh, occurred uh, hurricane seasons. And that allows us to say, what's the risk to any one property uh, in the next year or the next five years of being disabled by a storm? And what's the correlation between that and either other supplier locations or other, uh, you know, other retail distri distribution points, DCs, et cetera, that are in, in close proximity? Um, so we're able to, to say with, you know, from a statistical framework that there's a certain percent chance of uh, a large section of one uh, supply chain being disrupted at the same time in a given year. Um, and then we can translate that even further into um, you know, financial outcomes that would, would tie to that. So when we think about risk, that, that's part of the way we, we look at a hurricane or something to that nature, is to try and say, what's the, where are the correlations within a supply chain network and how might that affect a decision like um, choosing a supplier that would be outside of that area to create more resilience. Uh, versus having kind of all eggs in one geographic basket that are susceptible to, to impact at the same time. Nancy, any thoughts? Well, and I think that's where it gets to it. It's if you understand where your risks are because you do have that level of awareness and transparency into your supply chain um, to the detail of knowing the exact geographic or as close to exact geographic location, that's great. Then what do you do? And of course, there's the you can do um, kind of what we call physical mitigation. Do you actually then move? Do you make a decision to go with a supplier that's in a different area? And then there's the trade-offs associated with the cost of the move. And then what they themselves may actually, over a longer term, depending on the level of investment, be exposed to from that type of risk. Then there's just what we call kind of the, the information approach to that. What do I need to monitor to see if this really is a risk? Because regretfully, the weather or, or any of these changes, they're not static. So something that's a risk for the next five to six years may just as well, being a dynamic system, not be the same type of risk. So you have to do the trade-offs of whether or not do I have to respond to that risk right now, and if not, then what do I need to, to monitor? What's the date I need to monitor that will give me a trigger that says, oh, it's now a higher prioritized risk? And then, of course, there's the, um, we talked, from a financial perspective, how much can I use insurance to actually address this risk? Um, and, and really, I think a more resilient supply chain now is one that's really looking at both the physical, the information, and the financial at the same time, and what's working best as a risk mitigation strategy for you for this type of risk. Uh, in particular, one of the things that we've been doing at, at Ernst & Young is looking at how to use procurement and procurement requirements um, and what do you actually have to think of as specifics? So now you're actually asking the supplier, and this is the work that I'd done at the federal government, which is 
if you are in a particular, if you're now in New York, right, and you've gone through this, and you're building, what kind of building codes have you built to? If you can take one hit of a Sandy, and the whole idea between weather impact is that you're going to have more or stronger Sandys, are you actually resilient enough to live through another one and it not be in, in a, you know, five years or ten years, but maybe two? So actually having those type of uh, awarenesses of how do you actually make the supplier uh, as resilient as possible. So along those lines, you gave some ideas. What are some thoughts you want to give to this audience around preparing for some of these major uh, weather and climate issues that we've got facing us as we go forward? You want to go ahead, sir? Well, I think for when you take a look at, at some of this, it is, again, awareness, right? It's key to understand what the risk actually is. But then it's as, and that's a data problem, and we've had data, the access to data, be something that was mentioned several times throughout the conference here. So add that to the list. We also, as a panel, think data is, is going to be important. But then when you know that, uh, it is an issue of trade-offs and what do you want to do. It's understanding um, where your suppliers uh, have that risk within them. It is the concern of co-location, so where you want those suppliers to be at. It is looking at the, the routes. There was a mention of hurricanes or earthquakes. So one of the things that we've looked at map-wise is if you're looking at rail, where are areas where rail is located that if you do have an increase in earthquakes, that you would have a certain time that you're unable to transport that way because it's going to take them a longer time to go ahead and recover from that. So this is a type of awareness of saying, hmm, you know, does that go into the factoring that I do as I pick kind of my transportation modality? In the same way that there's some benefit in knowing I can now transport Northeast Passage, the question is, do I still want to stick with some of the other modalities that I have? So those are just some of the things. But it's very, very complex um, and very challenging to do. But it's becoming more granular is what I hear you saying. In other words, it's not just a geography or an, you know, one particular portion of the world. You really need to get into the details to really understand where the issues may be. And they're not even, we talk about, we talk about weather, um, we talk about access to, to natural resources, but there's also, as Kyle had mentioned, um, just the changing in temperature. So how many here have tracked greening disease in Florida? How many of you like orange juice? So the greening disease since 2005, it's a little bacteria that came over and it's, uh, it gets into the trees, the orange trees, and it can incubate in there for about two years. But once, that, once it's in the tree and the tree catches this, you know, the bacteria goes ahead and infects it, basically the tree dies and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't save it, you can't inoculate it, tree dies. And so the state of Florida has, since 2000, about 2004, 2005, experienced $4.5 billion of loss because of the greening disease. 8,000 jobs because of greening disease. And so when you start thinking about temperature changes, one of the things, it's not purely causal, but one of the things that they point to is the fact that you did not have hard winters to kill this. And you had that along with drought, which already made some of the trees a little bit more um, uh, predisposed to being weaker, just like kind of a, our own physical body. If you're stressed and tired, you're more likely to catch a cold than not. And so the cost of this, so what else is just out there as far as crops are concerned? And there are other examples, but where there is a bug that wouldn't necessarily have come out or be viable because you had the natural seasons and you don't have the same seasons any longer because of the changing temperature. So yeah, talking about really expanding your understanding of a risk is, it's gotten pretty interesting. So if I could just add one thing to that. So I might, in terms of preparing for how to, how to work with these kinds of new risks, part of what I think is, is the opportunity that lies in that is to, uh, to be able to leverage different kinds of data because, because the fact these risks are increasing, there's been a lot of investment both in the private sector like our firm and also in the governments to create new data resources around around weather and its impacts that could be leveraged operationally to create a competitive advantage. And I think that that's what's, what I find in many cases is that organizations voice that they use weather information in what they do. Uh, but when we talk about the sources of that, it's often 
um, not very granular data, or it might be information that's not, uh, you know, not necessarily of the highest quality. It's kind of you know the things that that um, you know, a predictive analytics team found out on the web and grabbed it and started working with it. But um, what uh, I think the opportunity is is you you think about how to prepare for leveraging that kind of information to your benefit in the future. There's a vast amount of, of, of uh, information that's coming forward when you merge things between satellites, computer models, and some of the new observational systems that are out there. Uh, you can get fidelity that just really was not possible in the past. And, and look at that over 10, 20, or 30 years, um, which would allow one to, to train a predictive analytic and drive um, you know, a, a demand type of uh, a process in a different way. So I would really encourage uh, each of each of you looking into you know the uh, where there are intersections with your business could higher precision data or more extensive data around what the weather is play a role in, in being able to predict that much uh, more accurately because there truly is a revolution in the, the quality of data uh, that's taking place right now in the in the area around the environment and, and and the weather being a part of that and it seems to me that there's a gap between the way industry is leveraging that and the way other groups that we serve, like the intelligence community, are, are leveraging that. Because we spend an awful lot of time with that audience leveraging that kind of precision, but it, it hasn't really found its way into the, the operational procedures in, in many of the areas that we've, we've looked into. It's almost like a um, protection of the people versus protection of our business and our, our ultimately supply chain. I think in, in part, but I think it's also because when you talk about like the intelligence community, because of the, their role in the government, they're often funding the, the development of these new observational systems, so they have more awareness that they're out there, and they have a little bit more of a vested interest in seeing that come uh, into a, a direct value proposition. And quite frankly, it's part of my responsibility to help help make make it aware that there, there's these new resources out there. So I feel like part of it is that just the information is not necessarily getting out that there is this this uh, greater degree of precision, and also a new way to look at history which is part of what we do, is we can, we can rebuild history now with what we know today um, by taking old data sets and improving them, which was something that we really couldn't, couldn't do maybe five years ago. Right, but uh, along those lines, you still can't necessarily predict going forward because of the changes that are occurring and the way things are happening, right? Yeah, there's, there's some things we can predict and there's some things we can't. And, then, and again, our role as kind of a science-based organization is to be really frank about that. Um, a lot of folks uh, do try and pre predict some things, but uh, you know, things can't be always predicted with, with good accuracy at long lead times. But uh, if you care about you know, what it's going to be like in this winter, um, you know, that's something we can predict with a high degree uh, of accuracy. And, and really, you know, that, that accuracy really kicks in in about two weeks. So, so enlighten us. What's that? Enlighten us on the winter. <laughs> uh, well, I'll know in two weeks. Okay. Um, but you know, in, in general, um, we get we have certain areas where we can do forecasting, um, you know, three to six months in advance or a little further with with a high degree uh, of accuracy. And there's other situations where um, you just can't, and you need to be kind of frank about that. Um, but uh, you know, the winter uh, winter temperatures in Europe and North America, in, in particular, is something that the quality of those forecasts have become. Uh, very good with that kind of three plus month lead time. So just as an idea here, what's considered high degree of accuracy? Um, well, we could say if it's going to be a, you know, an above or below average winter in terms of temperature across different parts of Western Europe or uh, the eastern two-thirds of the United States. Um, and it, you know, when I use the term accuracy, if I'm trying to say what it's going to be like in January, I'm talking about kind of percent departures from normal, not not January 21st is going to be you know, 13 <laughs> degrees at a given location, but you can do that at a metropolitan area. Say something about is it going to be above or below average, and that traditionally in the past that's been used largely in the commodities sector, um, but it's finding its way more toward uses as at least as we're experiencing more for uh, thinking about uh, things that are outside of just hedging or, or, or that kind of application. So I'll talk a little bit about what you're seeing the use around hedging and commodity and how that's being utilized. Um, so in the, in the past, in the hedging world, um, you know, energy was really where uh, things have been very active. If we go back five to eight years ago, there's an awful lot of 
um, trading that would take place, and, and, and I'll differentiate trading from hedging in that trading is a little bit more opportunistic. Uh, hedging is more of a risk management strategy, is the way I think of it. But on the energy side, you know, that was uh, you know, a very active market going five or eight years ago. Uh, today, with the, uh, the expansion of natural gas, uh, the price volatility in the energy market is much less. Uh, but conversely, in the ag markets, we see commodity prices to have just exceptional variation uh, today globally. And it could be whether you look at wheat or you look at other types of, uh, of crops, there's a lot of volatility. And so as part of a risk management strategy, you know, uh, hedging to lock in commodity price based on what's anticipated in, in the future is, is a, a huge opportunity. Those decisions tend to be big and not very frequent, but can have a, a large impact. Um, and that's where we see individual corporations applying hedge strategies. And that you know, food and beverage organizations, many of yours, I'm sure, have that type of function in-house. And, and those are, are quite active applications of, of hedging to, to try and reduce earnings volatility by locking in commodity price. So Nancy hit a little bit about um, the water levels and the changes with the polar bears and whatnot. There's an awful lot of discussion, too, on companies deciding where they're going to put new facilities in that based on the fact that there's a lot of predictions out there that the water levels are going to rise and the ocean's coming up. Um, any thoughts on that or things that we shouldn't worry about or how to view that? Well, I think there's two things. Um, one is just this discussion of what water level rising really means, and a lot of it is the same way that we saw with Sandy. You have a storm come in, and with the water level rising, you're going to have more of that storm water come into inland than you would have had previously. And so, you know, that's a bigger impact. So you've got certain areas now that are at risk that you would have never thought because you've not seen water there before. So there's that. Um, then there's just also this assumption of water availability, and we talk a lot about the risk and on the supply side, but what about the demand side? So. Uh, how many here are aware of uh, Levi's washless jeans? You guys are not into... So you don't have a, a younger brother who never wants to even wash them, much less have intense conversations about bathing practices. No, let's not go there. Um, but so it's, it's actually, it's a really wonderful product and there's an understanding that you now need to think about some of your products in a world in which where there are resources that we take for granted that may not be for granted, particularly in the emerging markets where you're trying to sell them. And so now you've got a pair of jeans that really are washless jeans, you understand. So the question is, what does change in natural resource availability afford you as a new kind of competitive advantage for products that because you distinguish um, and you take and you actually embrace the fact that something's not available, what does that mean? because it's something that your consumers in that market are going to have to pay attention to and they are paying attention to. So we see a lot of conversation from that perspective, not always just looking at climate change or sustainability as risk characteristics, but actually for opportunities for competitive advantage and innovation and new ways of rethinking your supply chain and actually rethinking what you're ultimately offering to the customer. So it's a resilience of the company. It, the it gets to the big idea of sustainability, right? The fact that we're all going to be here come 20, 40 years from now. I'm going to open this up. Are there any questions out here for our panelists? Laura, please. I think we have a question around granular weather data. Uh, you know, we're talking about that insurance is using it. What steps could people take in the audience to start using weather data? You know, we've never had it at a granular level like we do today. Um, so, I guess in terms of uh, the best way to maybe get started and trying to think about how to use that, I would I would encourage maybe uh, you to, to inquire across your organization a bit in, in terms of how that information is leveraged today and what information is used, just to take a, a little bit of a survey around what's what's being leveraged, um, and, and maybe simultaneous with with you know, asking a couple of those questions to to those groups that use it and yourself about. If it was much more precise, could it could it create an opportunity? In some cases, it would not, but I think in many it would, um, because uh, in general, um, I guess I would say with the precision of data and the latency, the the opportunities to create um, a specific measure at again an individual rooftop level are are there on a global scale today, and so. 
Um, what, we, what we spend a lot of our time on is building a custom, uh, custom set of resources that tie into directly to an application and add an impact layer on top of it. Um, so um, I think it's probably a, a, the best exercise is to start inside the organization and, and really see what the opportunity is and then engage, you know, you know yeah, I'd be happy to speak with you or you can engage others that are close to the weather industry and, and um, I think you quickly find that they can drive the weather information now down to the need that would fit uh, your desire. Um, uh, so that's probably the fastest way to converge on where, where the opportunities are. But also, um, uh, what I'd encourage also is not just focusing on the weather information per se, but what's the actual impact of the weather information that's, that's going to trigger either a decision or trigger uh, demand or, or other factors. Because there's other techniques that are now available to, to get much more precise around the impact. If it's a change in, in terms of you know, the way the civil infrastructure would be affected, um, we can do that today in ways that we couldn't before. So like with Sandy, uh, we can be, you know, when Sandy was evolving, we were very descriptive around where landfall was going to occur three days beforehand. We are also very descriptive on where the flooding would take place and how deep it was, but we are also translating that to electrical substations that would be inundated and sections of the electrical grid that would be taken down and how long it would take to restore it back and which properties gain their service from those substations. Um, and so, you know, that's the kind of thing we can do now at, at, at a national scale. Um, to understand, you know, intersections of, again, weather and infrastructure to put it in the context of an impact. So um, I think, you know, in general, there's an awful lot of opportunity to be quite precise around um, the impact of the weather in that way. Um, yeah. Kyle, Trevor Miles can access. You preempted my question, uh, which was very nice to see. And that is, we've spoken a lot about identification. And when I go to conferences, I see a lot about risk identification, but very little discussion on impact analysis and recovery. And I'm just fascinated why we not get into that stage. And your description of impact analysis is very good. But if we put it into the context of supply chain, it's okay if that power grid goes down which of my facilities are impacted. But it goes beyond that. Now what demand is not going to be satisfied? What orders are, not, are therefore not going to be uh, fulfilled? What materials have I bought to go into that factory, but that factory is now going to be down? And then the recovery question is, how long is it going to be for me to get back up? Mm -hmm. And what are my mitigation strategies in that interim while that facility is down? Um, and I. I hear far too little discussion, in my opinion, of those aspects. Is, have you any indication of why this is? My impression is I think that you know, the organizations that, that specialize in weather often kind of that's all they do. You know, they don't, um, either don't have the resources or the technical expertise to, to translate it into those three dimensions you know, further. Um, and I think what the, in, the, in the past, many of the organizations that have focused on weather, climate, or environmental data have been specialists in that niche. I think what, what, um, what is, is taking place in the industry right now is the needs are, are very much more what you described. Um, it's great to know what the, the temperature is going to be tomorrow, but that doesn't really have value if you can't you know, take it those steps further. And so what you're seeing now is really a shift in the way in which people think about bringing that kind of information to bear. And that's, what, that's part of what we're trying to help facilitate is we, um, and that's, that's part of why you know, we find ourselves in the midst of a, a, you know, a global data analytics organization that has a healthcare business and you know, all these different environmental health and safety businesses, all these different segments, because uh, what we're trying to do is do that. We're trying to take it into those different dimensions, bring civil engineering, bring you know, financial, bring you know, industry expertise in conjunction with something that's more a more precise view of the weather. Um, and then we can use the weather information, which has to be extremely precise, as the input rather than the output. Um, that's really what we, we seek to do. And, um, and to do that well, we have to really partner with industries to make sure it's presented in the right framework. Um, and, you know, and then I think that's really what we see our, our responsibility to be. But I would, I would also say that you're not seeing some of those conversations happen because, again, all of this is contextual, right? If you don't know, 
I can't tell you, even if I put the weather data in as an input to the system modeling, you need to give me the boundaries of the system. And right now, for most of the clients we talk to, they can't describe to us their geographic, uh, their, their supply chain in geographic terms. So what we're forced to then have is these really kind of higher end strategic discussions, and that still lends itself to a risk discussion, but it does not lend itself to a worthwhile mitigation conversation, right? And what we're hoping, you know, you say, why don't you have more of those conversations? We want to have more of those conversations. And we think actually for future, it's absolutely necessary, especially for the complexity of the supply chains we're seeing now. And it's as much the weather as it is just understanding the resource availability, you know, and, and knowing what are you doing in terms of having that available both for your manufacturing processes, just for your input, source inputs, things of that nature. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Hi, Glenn Goldbach from PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, really appreciate the point about not understanding your sort of extended supply chain network. I also have this conversation almost daily, and people don't know where their suppliers are or who their true partners are. Um, what I see from so my perspective, and I'd like to maybe have you add on to it, is it's a very theoretical conversation most of the time. And it doesn't get down to the tactical and practical piece. And so my hypothesis is it's because people are measured on like cost and performance. So if it's a supplier risk, you know, sole sourcing might be the lowest unit price. Or if it's, um, uh, you know, any of those types of things that can drive either a, a geographic density or, or, or drive some other things, which subjects then to weather risk or geopolitical risk or some other things. So I'm curious if you have any experience where someone has been able to convert this to a more practical solution and what role measurements have in that, in that option. Um, so I guess I'll speak a little bit from my experience. Um, in terms of the way in which we would, we would take, a, you know, a, a, I'm going to go more toward kind of a, a weather analytic from a demand planning perspective and try and calculate that down to an overall impact. Um, most of what we've seen is the you know, proportional improvement that can be gained by having a tailored impact kind of assessment um, between you know, kind of the old regime of, of going off of forecasting versus the new and then quantifying that back to either you know, save shipping costs or you know, other factors of that nature. Um, but we, we aren't, it's, I guess what I find is challenging is to quantify that before doing pilots or doing some kind of form of first phase implementation. So often we discover that, that value together with the customer as we go. Uh, it's a little harder to prescribe what it's going to mean on day one uh, because often the information hasn't been uh, of high enough precision to date to really embed itself into an operation. Um, and so it, you know, I think often we underestimate the level of impact that we'll have um, until it gets you know, fully into the hands of, of folks that are kind of deeply threaded throughout that that operational process. Um, so it's been hard to quantify that kind of impact before we take those initial steps to drive it, drive it down. Um, so I don't know if that really addresses your question, but I guess in general we, we have to discover the value through, through some piloting um, and then build upon it incrementally often is, is the way we are able to drill it down to a kind of measures that someone would ascribe back to their own individual or team performance. Is, is part of it also maybe perhaps the fact that there's so many f siloed functions and it's not necessarily my area of, of expertise nor it fits across the supply chain? And I, I know in our conversation earlier today, we spoke about the fact that there's not one person who's handling all of this and they don't understand the aspects that some of this can bring to the equation. So it's almost a knowledge factor that has to be brought back in to the overall basis, yeah, right? I think that's, that's probably fair. Yeah. I think um, as was talked about, throughout the, uh, the day and a half here of, of meeting. For multiple purposes, it sounds like we're gonna bring people together in a room. <laughs> I think this is just another item on the agenda of having to bring them together. And it's just, you know, if you think about what is a new understanding of supply chains, it is the need to really bring leaders from the different sectors to area together and have these conversations in particular from a risk and an opportunity perspective. So as, yeah. we, close this, as we close this out here, I wanna ask each, each of you to leave us with a thought about the role of climate change and supply chain 
and something you would suggest to this audience? So I guess to start with that, I guess uh, you know, the way I would, I want to maybe frame with one example of a piece of technology that, that you should be thinking about if it would be relevant to your sector. But one of the things that we spend a lot of time on in addition to weather is, is actually leveraging satellite-based data as um, a resource that's of, of kind of unique precision and value. And for, just to frame what's possible, um, if you think about uh, if you wanted to monitor uh, you know, any, any area uh, of interest within your supply chain, today a satellite would fly over and be able to take a picture of that about every two, three days. Um, in uh, three to five years, you'll probably be able to reduce that time to about two to three hours. Um, so there, that's an example of a kind of technology asset that in, in the very near future will allow uh, you know, monitoring of, of things on a global scale with an explosion of, of different uh, data. So I, I would encourage, um, encourage you to, one, think about how uh, environmental data is playing a role in your organizations today, um, even if it's outside of your own uh, area of expertise. If you know that there's an emergency operations team that leverages data, maybe you know, use it as an opportunity to try and understand what, what they utilize. If there's a, a group that does this kind of commodities-based work, understand a little bit about what they do, and just challenge, the, challenge that uh, team a little bit to, to see, you know, it, do you have the right information that you might need? Um, uh, could, could you benefit from something with more precision? Because quite often the data that would play a role in, in each of these areas has some commonality and can be cross-leveraged. Um, that could make some complexity as well if, if you have to have more of an enterprise-wide use. But I think exploring that out would be, a, would be um, what I would encourage you to do. Um, and you might discover that you know, the resources are, are not maybe taking advantage of where the, the technology is headed. Uh, and it might result in just a, you know, a dialogue about you know, what, what should we be thinking about for that next three, four, five years into the future. Um, and then, again, I'd encourage you to bring someone in from the science or technology side to, to brief that group around what's possible and, and just get a, conversation, get a conversation going. Nancy? I would just say it's as simple as um, understand your supply chain, where it's at. Geographically understand it. And for those of you who have to grapple with the conflict minerals requirement from SEC, you know, the idea of not only what you have but where it originates, just traceability, food area, you, you're going to need to know this sooner rather than later anyway. There are going to be more requirements coming down. So know your supply chain. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thanks, guys.